A small hook, dressed with feathers and fur, is cast and laid expertly on the water. A trout breaks the surface, momentarily venturing into the world of air as it rises to the tiny lure. A lightning strike and the great deception claims success. A game fish, dominated by its aggressive but diffident instinct, has fallen for the most crafty of all traps. There was no worm on that little hook, only an imitation of a delicate, ethereal, living creature, an insect. In this case, an ephemera. This is fly fishing, the most exciting and sophisticated way of fishing, which more than a way to catch fish is almost a philosophy unto itself. And yet, in spite of what people often say or write, it is not difficult. And it is not a technique restricted to a few select anglers and entomologists. In spite of its apparent complexity, fly fishing involves the simplest of secrets, dedication, the ability to apply oneself meticulously, and a knack for observation. Are these not the secrets of every fisherman? Nothing out of the ordinary, then. But why tie your own flies? Why not use the excellent ones that are sold in the shops? There are at least two fundamental answers. First, for the sheer pleasure of doing it yourself. And second, to give an even greater sense of personal achievement to your catch. The aim of this short course is to show in the most comprehensive way possible the basic techniques of tying flies and the materials required. In this context, we will be concentrating our attention on dry flies. In fact, the art of tying dry flies requires the whole span of dressing techniques and is always producing interesting innovations, from classic flies to the devot, from parachute flies to no hackles, from floating nymphs to emergers. This is the workbench with everything you need. A vise and a complete range of tools. A bobbin holder, hackle pliers, scissors, whip finishing tool, and tying thread in various sizes and colors. These are cocknecks, dressing mainstays. Then, natural furs from deer hair to squirrel tail, and feathers, hen pheasant, and peacock. Artificial or vegetable fibers, more feathers, golden pheasant, or condor. And finally, the glues. And of course, the central element, hooks. Now, little by little, we will demonstrate the use of all these tools and materials. American March Brown, Pheasant Tail, Thorax, Iris. These four flies require most of the dressing elements that we will encounter as we move on. We'll be learning what they are called and how to put them together. Naturally, every fly begins with the hook, which must be locked in the vise with the shank lying horizontal or tipped slightly upwards. This is the bobbin, which is used to keep the thread taut at all times. Start by holding the bobbin in the right hand and the end of the thread in the left hand. Hold the end of the thread against the hook shank about two-thirds of the way along. Now, keeping the thread taut, wind a few spirals around the shank over the end held in the left hand. Remember, keep the thread taut at all times. Continue to wind the thread around until the end is bound down tight along the shank, and then cut the surplus thread end. Continue to wind the thread around the shank until you reach the bend.
The most common material used to make tails is fibers taken from cock's neck feathers. The fibers must be selected from a large feather so that they will be as long as possible and both rigid and elastic at the same time. Pull some out and measure them. The tail should be about the same length as the hook shank. Place the fibers on top of the shank and keeping them steady start to fix them in place. Squeeze the hook, fibers and thread tightly in your fingers. Just a couple of winds and the tail's fixed. Wind the thread around a few more times for safety's sake and cut off the surplus. These tails are tied in a bunch and have the advantage of being extremely strong. Another way of tying tails is to make a small ball at the end of the shank using tying thread. Wind the thread around and around on the same spot to make a small bulge that will cause the tail to fan out. Take a tuft of cock's neck fibers, place it on the hook, and tie it on. Now run the thread back behind the bulge. Held tightly between the end of the thread and the bulge, the fibers automatically fan out. The advantage of this system over the other is that the area covered on the water is considerably larger. There is another method of tying the tail which also makes it fan out. Place the fibers on the hook, fixing them in position in the usual way, then keeping the thread as taut as possible Wind it under the tail once between the fibers and the shank. Another wind over the top and the tail begins to open. This method has one great advantage. The tail fans out but compared to the preceding method much less material is used and so the body of the fly is much more slender. Now, here's a fourth method. The tail opens in a V-shape. First, give the tying thread a thin veneer of hard wax. Then, take a pinch of the material that will be used to make the body. In this case, poly yarn, a synthetic material used a lot in fly tying. A small tuft is sufficient. Rub it onto the thread, completely covering it. Then, wind the thread onto the shank, making the same bulge as before. Tear off some cock's neck fibers. Measure them. and bind them onto the shank. Then use the left hand to divide the fibers in two, using the bulge to keep them apart.
This kind of tail usually helps buoyancy and also makes a pretty good imitation of an ephemeris tail. But not all dry fly tails are designed with floating and imitation in mind. Some, like the red tag, for instance, are designed to attract fish. In this case, the tail is made with a tuft of synthetic material or wool or other animal fibers dyed red. Bind on the tail in the usual way. Then use the scissors to shape it and cut off the excess part. The easiest way to tie the body of a fly is to use fibers from bird feathers. In this case, the large tail feathers of the peacock. Peel off two or three fibers. Set them on the hook and bind them into place right behind the tail. Wind the thread around a few more times for safety. Then cut off the excess part and wind the thread back towards the down eye to where you want the body to end. Now, twist the fibers into a tightly knit cord. Then, still twisting, wind it onto the shank in tight spirals. In this way. Now, as you can see, the body of the fly is beginning to take shape. Another two spirals. And then pass the thread under the fibers, changing hands to make it easier, and fasten them. Cut off the surplus and the body is finished. The pheasant tail. This classic fly is, as the name suggests, made with pheasant tail fibers. Peel off five or six, which will be enough for the tail and the body of the fly. Then measure off the tail, place the fibers on the shank, and fasten them. making sure at all times to hold everything tight. The hook, the fibers, and the thread. Another couple of winds, and the tails in place. Now, cut off some of the fibers, because if not, the body will be too big. Bend the remaining fibers back, and bind them. The body of this fly has a golden tinsel rib. In this case, the tinsel is round, but it can also be flat. Cut off a few centimeters and place it between the shank and the tying thread. Wind the thread around a few times and cut off the surplus. These are hackle pliers. They are used to hold firmly in place materials to be wound onto the shank. Hold the pheasant fibers in the pliers 
and wind them onto the shank in tight spirals, twisting them at the same time. The weight of the pliers, if you need to let them go, is enough to keep the materials taut and prevent the partially tied fly from coming apart. Pass the thread under the fibers and wind it around a few times to bind everything together. Cut off the surplus part and repeat the same operation with the tinsel, but this time with wide spirals in the opposite direction. This will make the body stronger. Tie in the tinsel and cut off the surplus. The hackle of the fly requires one or more cock's feathers. They should be as long and thin as possible and the fibers must be slightly longer than the shape of the hook. The pheasant tail requires two feathers, one red, the other gray. Before they are tied, all the fibers at the base of the feathers must be cleaned off. Besides being too long, they are covered in down and therefore tend to soak up water. Pull off all the excess fibers. The feathers must be tied upside down, that is, with a naturally concave side out, like this. Place them along the edges of the shank facing backwards so that they can be tied down from the end of the shank to the eye of the hook. Fasten the thread. Cut off the surplus. And now, Use the hackle pliers to twist the feathers into place one at a time. Start with the one furthest away, twisting it onto the body in fairly tight spirals. As you can see, winding it on at an angle creates the hackle or raised collar at the end of the hook, which will allow the fly to float. Tie the first feather into place with a few winds of thread right behind the eye and cut off the surplus. Repeat the same operation with the other feather, making sure as you twist it onto the body that the spirals slot into the spaces left free by the first feather, so creating a compact, evenly shaped hackle or collar. Tie in the second feather. and cut off the surplus. At this point, the fly is finished. And the last step is to tie it off using the whip finishing tool. There are two types of this tool, the conical model and the classic whip finisher. The conical finisher is ideal for pushing the fibers back to form the fly's head. As you can see, it is easy to use and, if necessary, can be substituted with the empty case of a ballpoint pen. This is how to use the classic whip finisher. Hook the thread with both hooks and twist. 
while the left hand, which is holding the bobbin, pulls the thread down parallel with the workbench. Hold the thread close to the fly's head and twist the finishing tool winding the thread onto the hook. Then release the two hooks one at a time, at the same time pulling the thread. Let's take another look at that. Then cut the thread and the fly is finished and just needs a final touch. Another way of making the fly's body is by using a quill, or rather, the central part of a cock's feather. First, strip off all the feathers. The naked quill is like a very long, slender cone, pointed like a pin at the top and much wider at the base. Strip off a few centimeters as much as is necessary and cut off the point and the base. The quill will be tied at the top end where it is thinnest to give the body a more conical effect. With this in mind, use the tying thread to create a small bulge near the thorax. When this is done, use the pliers to twist the quill along the whole body in tight spirals. One thing is very important. If the cock's neck has not been well conserved, the quills of the largest feathers, the ones that are used in this case, could easily have lost their natural elasticity and when twisted onto such a narrow surface might easily break. In any case, when buying necks in a shop, it is better for this operation to choose ones with feathers that are the most pliable. Cox quills are ideal for imitating an ephemera's abdominal rings. However, it is possible that fish will find bodies with more down more attractive. At this point, stop winding and tie in with a couple of winds of thread, like this. Now another few winds for safety. Cut off the surplus and the fly's body is ready. In the past few years, poly yarn has been preferred by artificial fly makers above all other dubbing or down materials. Use a little solid wax to attach this synthetic down to the thread. Polyon is easy to use. It is made up of very, very thin, fairly long fibers. It can be compressed or tied in like fluff. It floats pretty well, and when saturated, a couple of false casts will dry it off completely. Furthermore, it can be found on sale in an amazing selection of shades and colors. As you can see, it takes no time at all to tie it in. Wind the thread around a few more times, adjust the shape a little, and the poly body is ready. Every fly tire has his favorite flies and preferred techniques. As far as the tails of artificial flies are concerned, personally, I prefer to use this technique, which I illustrated at the beginning. It is ideal for making fanned out tails and has no excess materials that might change the silhouette of the body.
The next body is also made of quill. This time we'll use a peacock feather, or rather a hurl from the eye of the big tail feathers. It is important to take it from the eye area because the widest and strongest quills are found here. In this case, we'll be using a dyed yellow feather. In its natural state, the little quill looks reddish or brown. Stripping the hair off a peacock hurl can be more difficult than expected. The best way is to use a typewriter eraser. The roughness and rigidity make it easier to strip off the down that covers the quill. Repeat the operation on both sides. Don't worry if it doesn't all come off, as long as it doesn't make a difference to the general look of the body. After cleaning the necessary section, cut off the end of the hurl and then place it on the hook. Tying it on as if it was to be used for ribbing. Like this. Next, to give the body a conical effect, it is necessary to add some material to the thread and then wind it on normally. In this case, for practical purposes, the material is poly. But the same effect can be achieved by winding on the thread itself or with any other dubbing material. When this preliminary operation is completed, use the pliers to start winding in the quill. Take great care to keep the spirals tight without overlapping them, which would have a negative effect on the look of the body. Since the quill's natural dark shades reproduce with incredible accuracy and ephemera's abdominal rings. Bodies made like this have the indubitable advantage of looking like the real thing. But even so, many fly tires prefer to use fluffier materials, leaving ends that tend to flutter in the water, giving the artificial fly an even more lifelike look. A few more winds. Cut away the excess material, as usual. and the body is ready. It is now time to make the acquaintance of a material with a particularly exotic name, Gallopardo. The ends of this bird's feathers have extremely slender, transparent fibers in a wide range of colors. We will be using them to make the tiny tail of an emerger the stage in an insect's life just before it emerges from the exuviae. Tie them on, keeping the length shorter than usual and bend slightly downwards. To obtain this effect, once the fibers have been tied in, all that's required is to wind the thread onto the bend of the hook. At this point, cut off the surplus and begin to tie in the ribbing. In this case, we use a piece of normal tying thread with a wide section, the color being bright yellow. Tie it on with regular tying thread. But instead of going on to tie in other materials to make the body, use the thread itself, winding it around and around, back and forth, over and over again. Making sure, however, to give the greatest possible conical effect to our little imitation. This quick, easy operation will produce an almost perfect silhouette. 
It's an ideal method for flies dressed on very small hooks, and in particular, for simulating emergers or small larvae. When the body is finished, use the pliers to achieve the ribbing with the yellow thread that we tied in before. Keep the spirals large and equally distanced, winding it on, in this case, in the opposite direction to the main dressing. A few more spirals to tie it in. Cut off the surplus thread and the body is complete. Our next fly is dressed with hair's ear. The gold-ribbed hair ear, or GRHE as it is commonly known, simulates the emerger nymph, or an ephemera of the Betides family. The tail of the fly is made from long hairs taken from the base of the hair's ear after the animal's under hair has been carefully removed. The idea in this case is to simulate the state of the water-bound nymph case just a few seconds before the minute insect passes to the done state and its brief airborne life cycle. Once the tail has been tied in with a few tight winds of thread, use the usual gold tinsel for the ribbing, which will make the fly glitter and so provide a more attractive lure for our finned friends. The thread must be well waxed before the hair's fur is applied. The body material comes from the hair's ear, which of course gives this fly its name, the gold ribbed hair's ear. The shaved off fibers are short and stiff but at the same time, they tend to stick together. In order to increase the consistency of the material to be used, it is advisable to add a small amount of under hair, which given its soft, fluffy texture, helps keep the dubbing together and makes it easier to apply to the thread. Obviously, the under hair will soak up water, but since the fly in question is designed to work just below the surface, this handicap does not pose any great problem for the angler, and is even an advantage in certain situations. In any case, spread the hair on the thread as compactly as possible, adding just a little more than is necessary. Strange though it may seem, in my experience, giving this fly a slightly confused look makes it especially attractive to trout. You might even say that the uglier this fly is, the more it catches, but there is a limit to everything and it doesn't pay to make it look excessively ugly. In other words, the golden rule is, although it's possible to make flies that are not pretty, they should never be sloppy and should always measure up to the dresser's pride in his work. The next step is the ribbing, using the usual method. In this case, too, it's important to keep the tinsel winds wide and evenly spaced and tight on the body. It is also essential to tie it firmly into place with thread because when a trout gets its teeth into it, the ribbing is the element that tends to come apart first. Now all that's required is a few finishing touches. The collar of this fly is also made of hair's fur, but requires longer, stiffer hairs. 
tear off a few tufts and mix in a pinch of the leftover body material. Apply it to the thread using the usual wax. If necessary, add more long stiff hairs and then wind the thread onto the shank in crisscrossing spirals until it makes a small bulge. A few more winds to make the head and then it's time to tie off the fly using the whip finisher. Two or three winds are enough for each knot. Make a second knot for safety and then cut the thread. Now use the dubbing needle to pick out a few fibers on the body, the longest ones possible to simulate the legs. Three or four times are enough to achieve the desired effect. And this is the final result. This is Kapok vegetable fiber obtained from the fruit of the tropical silk cotton tree. Kapok is used to make padding and is easily found in its whitish colored natural state. It can be dyed easily with normal material dyes. Although slight difficulties may be encountered because of the material's salient feature, it is waterproof. This, combined with its softness and transparency when wet, make it an ideal material for dressing flies. Kapok has one of the lowest specific weights and is among the most buoyant of all materials. And it takes no time at all to apply, although it is preferable to use liquid dubbing wax. Our first method for making wings is certainly the most complicated, shaped wings. Use two feathers from the body of a common hen, the straighter and wider the better. Remove the down at the base of the feathers. The common hen supplies excellent materials for both dry fly wings and the colors of wet flies. Common hen wings are light and strong. When wet, they tend to lose their original shape, but a few false casts are enough to dry them off completely. Use the special tool for shaping wings. Place the feather in the pliers with the concave side downwards and using a lighter flame, burn off the fibers that stick out. Repeat the same operation with the second feather, making sure to insert it in the pliers the other way round, or rather with the concave side facing upwards. When this has been done, the two feathers will have assumed the shape of the pliers, which is more or less a faithful reproduction of the shape of ephemera wings. Now the feathers must be cut down to size. The length of a fly's wings should be roughly the same as the length of the hook shank. After establishing the length, Remove all superfluous fibers, tearing them off as usual against the way they're slanted. Now we have our two little wings. 
Hold them in the left hand and place them on the hook at the point where the body ends, and tie them in with a few tight winds of thread. Cut off the excess. A few more winds for safety. Then pass the thread behind the wings to lift them up so that they will assume the characteristic erect position of done wings. To complete the dressing, use a single hackle chosen from those which have the most elastic fibers. Since the fly in question is a very close imitation, only a few winds of hackle are needed to keep the fly afloat without, however, burdening the silhouette with excess material. Tie in the hackle behind and in front of the wings. Cut away the surplus and start to wind it on. A couple of winds directly behind the wings are enough. And another two at the front of the fly. One more. Then tie in the hackle with a few winds of thread. Cut off the surplus and finish off the fly. Use the conical whip finisher to push back the excess fibers on the fly's head. Another knot. Then for safety, reinforce the tie-off with another knot, this time using the classic whip finisher. Now cut the tying thread and the fly is finished. To make the wings of the American March Brown, one of the best known classic flies, use the fibers of a mandarin duck's feather, or rather, its substitute. This is actually a teal feather dyed yellow. After stripping off the base, cut the quill about two centimeters above the tip. Gather the fibers in a tuft in the left hand and measure them on the hook. As before, they should be the same length as the shank. Tie the fibers in with a few tight winds of tying thread. Then pull back all the fibers. Pass the thread across in front of them and with several spiraling winds, create a kind of ridge which will oblige the fibers to assume the characteristic erect position. At this point, cut away excess fibers. Now divide the tuft in two using the dubbing needle or by hand. And then tie the two little bunches apart with a few crossed over winds of thread.
Now a couple of wines behind the wings, and this is the result. The next step is to apply a little poly and wind in the body between the bend and the wings. To complete the fly, choose fairly large hackles, one red cock, the other grizzly. Tie the quills into the middle of the wing bunches with a few winds of thread behind and in front of the wings. Cut off the surplus and wind on the hackles one at a time. Now the fly can be tied off. Make the knot with the whip finisher. One, two, three winds. And then, using a small plastic tube previously inserted into the bobbin holder, push all the material back to free the section of the fly next to the eye. Now use the whip finisher to make the head, which should be quite large. Cut the thread, remove the plastic tube, and the fly is finished. This is the American March Brown one of the best known and most effective of all classic flies. The wings of the thorax, another well-known American fly, are made from the fibers of two facing gray goose wing feathers. Originally, fibers from a turkey feather were used. Use the dubbing needle to extract two sections of the feather. When sections of the correct width have been chosen, clean off the fibers in front of and behind the desired section, and then trim it close to the quill. Do the same with the other feather, always making sure that the fibers do not lose the natural cohesion of their minute barbules. Wings in feather sections are used for many classic flies and certainly make pretty good imitations, even if they tend to fray after the first catch. Personally, I use them only for this model. Place the two sections side by side, concave side out, so that they immediately look like two small wings. Place them on the hook. Taking great care in this particular fly, in contrast to all others, to tie them on at the exact center of the shank. Holding the feathers tightly in the fingers of the left hand, tie them in facing forwards with a few very tight winds of thread. Another couple of winds for added strength, then trim off the excess. As before, wind on some thread in front of the wings to make them stand erect. To complete the fly, add a V-shaped tail separated by a little ball of poly, 
which will also be used for the body. Using a single hackle tied in behind and in front of the wings and finished off with more poly on the front section. Tie off with the whip finisher. Cut the thread and the fly is virtually finished. A final touch. Use the scissors to snip off all the hackle fibers on the underside of the shank. This will increase the fly's surface area and make it more stable in the water. Now for another classic fly, this time of English origin, the Lund's particular. The body is made from a red cox quill, the wings from the tips of two grey or dun cox feathers. Select the tips of the two hackles, measure and strip them and trim off the part that's not needed. Wings made from cox hackle tips have an unusual feature. Although they are stiff, they are also flexible, which means they create no casting problems. For instance, they do not cause that annoying propeller effect created by more rigid materials, which leads to tangling. Furthermore, the neck fibers soak up very little water and are easily dried off with a few false casts. After the wings have been tied in with a few winds, trim the excess fibers. Tie them into the erect position. And then separate them into a V-shape with a few crisscrossed winds. Take care that when completed, they are straight, evenly cut, and well separated. And when the fly is finished, they must be longer than the fibers of the rather bushy neck made from red cox hackles. This is an imitation of a Cenis fly, with a body made from white tying thread, a V-shaped tail, and wings made of an artificial material. A word of caution. This fly is usually tied on a very small 1820 hook, but in order to illustrate it more clearly, a slightly larger hook has been used. In this case, the wings are known as spent wings and represent the last stage of an insect the dead fly floating on the surface. Tie them in like this, forming a cross with a few crisscrossed winds of tying thread. Spent wings can be made of a wide variety of materials, hackle tips, tufts of fibers, or, as in this case, a synthetic material. After the wings are tied in, the next step is to make the fly's thorax, which in this example is brown or dark gray. Apply a bunch of poly to the tying thread and wind it crisscrossed onto the hook until a small bump is formed. The spent fly is an imitation that the angler often fails to take into consideration. And yet, in the early morning, when the trout can be seen blowing bubbles almost kissing the surface, you can be sure they are feeding on dead insects. They do so at will, fully aware that their prey can no longer escape them. Make it a rule never to be without a good selection of these flies in your fly box, and this one in particular. Remember, the hooks are tiny, but you can be sure this little scenist will give you some excellent catches. The 
French call this the cul de canard, which is perhaps more elegant than the translation. The feathers in question are located around the uropegial gland of ducks and geese. We will use them to make the wings of the iris, a tiny fly that is the creation of the well-known Italian fly maker Piero Lumini. Get a good grip on the feather and tie it in right in front of where the body begins. Starting from the tip, wind on the thread so that it holds all the fibers in place. Trim off excess fibers, then bend the feather forward, measuring it against the length of the body, and tie it into place with several tight winds. Trim off the excess and then fold back the feather. A few winds behind it will bring it into the upright position. To complete the fly, wind a single hackle on a few times behind and in front of the wings. In my opinion, the cul de canard tied in this fashion exploits all the advantages this fly offers. Being made of minute barbules that trap tiny air bubbles, it is water repellent and a good floater. Its extreme softness creates no casting problems. And finally, the slightest movement causes its hurl to undulate, giving our little creation a breath of life that attracts trout more efficiently than a perfectly made static imitation. They are some of my favorite flies. They always fall correctly onto the water, they never sink, and they can be made very quickly. The fly is almost finished. Tie in the hackle. Cut off the surplus. And then, to make tying off the fly as easy as possible, slide a little plastic tube onto the body to keep the hook eye clear. The last step is a couple of knots with the whip finisher to complete the little imitation. Much has been said and written about cul de canard feathers. They are definitely one of the mainstays of fly tying, a popular material that cannot be substituted by any of the artificial fibers presently available. Now apply a little cement to the head of the fly. Slide off the tube, one or two final touches, and the fly is ready. This fly has a wide range of uses. When perfectly dry, it makes an excellent dun, but trim away part of the hackle and the tip of the cul de canard wing, and it will hang in the water semi-submerged like an emerger. Where the characteristics of the cul de canard really come into their own is in the imitation of emergers. Using a body made of tying thread with yellow stripes, add four fibers from a pheasant tail feather. Place them on the body with the quills facing backwards and secure them where the body begins. After tying them in with a few tight winds, cut away the base. At this point, choose a feather from among the thickest and richest of those long hurls which can be found at the base of all good quality feathers. Strip away the down until you have a small tuft, preferably made up of barbules which are all the same length. Place the tuft on the hook where the tying thread hangs.
If the fibers have been well chosen, they can be tied in so that both sides are even, like this. By folding some back, the volume of the tuft can be doubled. Use the scissors to remove all the residue that remained at the base of the fibers after they were stripped off the quill. This tuft is the fly's wings. Now, no, after making sure the thread is well waxed, make the thorax of the fly with squirrel's fur dyed black. This material is particularly useful. It is made up of long, very thin, fairly soft fibers. It can be bought already perfectly mixed with enough under hair, which makes it soft and bristly at the same time, and extremely easy to apply to the tying thread. Start winding it on behind the tuft of cul de canard, and then wind on the rest of the squirrel's fur in front of the wings, finishing close to the eye of the hook. Now, bend the four pheasant fibers towards the head of the fly, tying them in two by two on each side of the tuft. The pheasant fibers in this case reproduce the nymph's wing cases, protruding from the exuviae after the wings have been freed. Now represented by the tuft of cul de canard. And this will be the only thing visible when the fly is in the water, given its exceptional buoyancy. While the body will hang just below the surface, exactly like a nymph which is just emerging. Now the last thing to do is tie off the fly with a couple of knots, trying as much as possible to strengthen the binding of the pheasant fibers by winding the thread towards the back each time you use the whip finisher. One more knot. The usual final touches, and the fly is finished. Another tiny emerger, once again using squirrel's fur, this time dyed olive green. After tying the body, rib it with golden tinsel. This fly is made on a grub hook to make it look even more like a nymph emerging just below the surface. The emerger's barely developed wings will be represented by a cul de canard feather, which will ensure buoyancy. Tie it in flat according to the iris method, securing it firmly from the quill end. Trim away the excess, and then make the thorax with dark green squirrel's fur. Then fold the cul de canard forward and tie it in close to the eye. The wings, which are not yet fully extended, must be shorter than the body. Trim the excess, and the finished fly should look like this.
This type of dressing comes from the genius of French fly tire Aimé Deveau. In contrast to all classic methods, Deveau perfected a system that dresses the fly from the head and not from the tail. This makes it possible to bend the hackle fibers forward to give the fly more stability when afloat, especially in choppy waters. After using the tying thread to make a little ball next to the hook eye to simulate the fly's head, tie in two red cox hackles. This time, however, they must be facing forward. Tie them in, winding the thread towards the center of the shank. Different criteria must be used in choosing the hackles, which must have fibers that extend some way beyond the hook bend. It is important that each of the feathers is arranged so that its natural concaveness faces the eye. This will help to build up the characteristic cone shape that the fibers will have when the fly is finished. Devo flies are all known by numbers. This is the 699. After winding on the first hackle, tie it in with a few tight winds of thread, cut away excess fibers, and repeat the operation with the second hackle. For the dressing shown here, personally I find it easier to use two bobbin holders, one for the black thread and the other for the polytest that is used to make the body. This is of course an optional choice, and in any case the final result will be the same. The next step in the dressing is to try and trim away any cock fibers that are encroaching on the still empty part of the shank. Use the little plastic tube again, but this time independently from the bobbin holder. Slide the tube on as far as the bend, and then use the needle to bring the fibers forward again. Slide the tube back until it contains all the hackles. Now use a partridge feather to complete the collar. Strip off all the down at the base after choosing a feather which, like the hackles, must have hurls that extend far beyond the bend. Tie it in tightly on the side, making sure that the concave side faces out. This will help create the feather's conical shape as it is wound on. Two or three winds are enough, which is all the feather will allow. A word of caution, partridge fibers are fragile and break easily. For this reason, beginners may have to repeat this operation a few times before getting it right. Never tug at the feather while winding it on. The weight of the pliers should almost be enough to do the job for you. To tie in the tail, use the little tube again to push the partridge fibers forward. There is a vast array of Devo flies, all dressed in this way, and they cover the entire range of dry fly imitations. The difference being that they have what might be called a more impressionistic look than nature's river insects. According to its creator, the 699 is based on the Dipterans family. The fibers for the DeVos tail come in this case from the neck feather of a red cock. The longer and stiffer the better. When tied in, in a bunch with the thread, they should be longer than the fly's body. Use a second bobbin holder for this phase. The body of the 699 is made by winding on polytest, an artificial thread composed of dozens of super thin parallel fibers which expands when applied so that one wind covers a large area. With the first wind, secure the main thread. 
Pass the polytest under the tail and then wind it back progressively towards the thorax. Then with overlapping spirals, try to give the body as much of a conical shape as possible. At the same time, covering up part of the partridge and cock fibers. Then wind the black thread on in the opposite direction in wide spirals to form the ribbing. Tying off this fly requires all the versatility of the spring-loaded whip finisher, which given its shape and type of operation, allows tight knots to be made at any point on the hook, avoiding all obstacles. Once the fly is finished, it's enough to extract all the fibers from the tube in order to create the typical outline of Devoe flies. In this case, one of the most effective and famous choppy water flies, the 699. Parachute flies. The difference in the tying of this fly is in the arrangement of the hackle. It is not attached sideways onto the body, but quite flat, and must be tied in tightly behind and in front of the wings, which in this particular model are made from a cul de canard feather. It's important that the wings, however they are made, have an element that keeps them stiff, in this case, the quill. Trim off the excess fibers, and start to wind on the hackle, not around the shank, but around the wings. It is essential that each wind of the hackle passes under the preceding one. To do this, hold the wings in your free hand every half wind. According to how the fibers fall into place, two or three winds should be enough. Then tie in the feather close to the eye. Cut away the excess and proceed to tie off the fly once again using the plastic tube to facilitate the operation. Make a couple of knots, trying to bring the last wind of thread as far back as possible to give added strength and to stop the hackle unwinding. Free the fibers from the tube and the fly is finished. Note the sunburst or crown effect of the fibers, which makes this fly an excellent floater. This is another innovative fly of American origin. Its name speaks for itself, no hackles. The wings of this fly are in feather fibers and are not tied in on top of the body but on its sides. After measuring off the fibers, hold them tightly in place with the left hand, one on each side of the body, close to the head, and tie them in with several tight winds. The innovative element is the dressing of the fly, which does not depend on hackles to make it float. In fact, it will be kept afloat by the tail, the body, and part of the wings. Undoubtedly, in these done fly imitations, the absence of hackles makes them look much more like living insects. 
For the body, it is best to use animal furs or poly. Personally, I don't use this kind of fly much, and when I do, it is only when the water is not very choppy. Usually, I make them with poly or even with kapok to make them float better. Often, I tie off the fly when I reach this point, or sometimes, as in this case, I add a generous winding of poly close to the head in order to improve as much as possible this imitation's ability to float. Here we wind on the poly. Curiously, the no hackles is not very popular in Europe, and yet, in my experience, it makes a fine emerger. It's time to bid farewell to the family of ephemerae and turn our attention to dressing a sedge fly imitation. Begin by selecting a large cock's feather. Hold it in the right hand and open it by rubbing it the wrong way. Then trim the fibers unevenly to obtain what is known as a scraper. Now tie the feather in by the tip at the bend using thread well covered with dubbing. Cut away the excess and start to dress the fly's body, continuing to wind on poly almost up to the eye of the hook. In contrast to that of the ephemera, the body of the sedge fly is quite bulky. Now, use the scraper to make ribbing in wide spirals, making sure to wind in the feather edge on. The short, stiff fibers of the scraper are supposed to represent the insect's feet, even though nature never blessed it with so many. In any case, the scraper technique is used a lot in sedge imitations, both in classic models and in more modern ones. After the scraper has been wound on, tie it in tightly with thread so that it does not spring free. Trim excess fibers, then use the scissors to cut off all the fibers on the upper side of the fly. Sedge wings can be made in several ways. We'll start with the most classic method, or rather, by using a section of two diametrically opposed feathers from a hen pheasant's wing. There is no doubt that feather sections make excellent imitations, but they are very delicate and tend to fall apart. Therefore, they must be reinforced with a generous application of cement, the same that is used to seal off the fly's head. The cement must be spread evenly on a surface larger than the one to be used. Carry out the operation on one feather and then on the other, cementing the feathers more or less at the same level so that the two sections will be as similar as possible as far as consistency and length are concerned. When the cement is dry, extract two sections of the same width. Grip them together with the tips crossed and place them on the hook, not on the upper side of the body but facing outwards.
Successive winds of tying thread will tend to make the feathers rotate onto the body. The first winds should not be too tight, so that it will now be possible to position the wings correctly on the body, almost in the shape of a tiny roof. Then complete the operation with several very tight winds. It's important that the wings are not too open, but they should not cover the body completely either. Obviously, this fly is the imitation of a still insect, a condition which is hard to find on the water. And yet it is an extremely alluring fly. It's up to the angler to bring it to life, imitating the frenetic movements of a real insect by skidding it across the surface. Now complete this sedge with a thick neck made from two hackles, with fibers that must be longer than the shape of the hook. Tie them in facing backwards and trim off the excess. Then use the pliers to wind them on up to the head. First one. Then the other. This is how your finished sedge fly will look. Another way of making sedge wings is to use two whole feathers rather than two feather sections. In this case, use the wing feathers of a woodcock. Select from among the straightest one or two that are as similar as possible and in keeping with the size of the fly. Clean off the down at the base of each feather and apply cement to one at a time. This is necessary not only to reinforce the feathers, but also because the wide, rounded feathers must become long and compact. After applying cement liberally, Run the feather between your fingers in the direction of the fibers, in other words, from the base to the tip. At each pass, you will feel the cement drying as the feather stiffens into a tiny elongated spatula. After repeating the same operation with the other feather, position them on the hook one at a time. Tie in the first one on the side of the fly, making sure it is slightly tilted towards the middle of the body. Now tie in the second feather in the same way, but on the other side of the hook. After a few fairly loose winds, place the wings in the desired position and then reinforce them with a series of very tight winds. The next step is to cut off the excess part of each quill and then trim down the fibers and shape them into wings. Remember that when it is not flying, the sedge's wings are about a third longer than its body. Measure the right length and cut off the surplus. When the right measurements have been achieved, 
with a few judicious snips of the scissors, round off the corners to reproduce as faithfully as possible the shape of the insect's wings. Two cox hackles are needed to complete the fly. These are the sedges that I prefer. Their wings are strong enough and quite flexible, and they can be dressed with a wide range of feathers and in many different colors. At this point, our brief encounter comes to an end while our friend Piero concentrates on landing his umpteenth trout. We have studied only one aspect of tying flies. There is a whole world still to be discovered, the world of nymphs, wet flies, streamers, poppers, salmon flies, and saltwater flies. But after mastering these basic techniques, it is possible to overcome all fly tying problems. So get to work and enjoy yourselves. A successful deception is perhaps even more exciting than the actual catch. There is no greater thrill for any angler than seeing a trout strike at his own imitation fly, a just reward for the hours spent at home studying and tying the right fly for that particular occasion. It is no surprise, therefore, that once it is landed, the trout is put back in the water. Perhaps this gesture embraces an all-encompassing love for an ever more beleaguered environment that, even so, we try to dominate in every way we can. Wherever the rules of ecological conservation do not apply, it is only fitting that there should be just respect for a fish that gives us such a sense of joy and achievement. Let's learn how to win honorably. We have lured it out of its element, rendered it powerless. Why punish it any further? What's the point in killing it? <laughs>